Testing is being recorded. Good afternoon. Um, as Adrian said, my name is Bill Sage, I'm Region 7 Materials Engineer up in Watertown. Uh, I've been asked to speak to you today on uh, HMA paving for inspectors. Uh, hopefully give you some tips and tricks on uh, what to look for out there in the field. Some different topics of discussion that we're going to go through today. We're going to start off with an overview of 402, uh, talk about the different HMA density series, <clears throat> uh, preparation not only of uh, the project but also ourselves in advance of paving. Uh, we're going to go over joint adhesive, uh, tack coat, the paver itself, uh, also some paving defects, and then documentation. Um, so to start off, Section 402, uh, one of the big things in 402 is uh, seasonal limitation on top course. Uh, for upstate, it's April 15th to October 31st is called our normal season paving. Anything outside of that window, uh, we consider under warranty paving. And uh, so if you're going to be paving late into the season, into November and whatnot, you'd be having a separate meeting with your contractor and discussing those types of operations. It is important to note though, however, that um, surface temperature requirements listed in 402, they apply year round. So it doesn't matter if it's January or if it's July, uh, these limitations apply. Uh, for if you have one inch or less, uh, this is compacted depth, uh, you have to have a surface temperature of 50 degrees, okay? between one and three inches, 45. And if you're putting down a layer greater than three inches thick, 40. Um, how that's measured is you take three locations, 25 feet apart, and you'd use a, a surface thermometer or a low button style thermometer. You put that on the surface, you put some insulation over that for 10 minutes, and then you um, average the readings over those areas. Um, if you don't have a surface thermometer, you can also use an infrared temperature gun um, and obtain the readings in those three areas as well. Just make sure that you're getting uh, good or close to the ground so that you're not measuring the air in between the gun and the ground. So next we're going to discuss some of the HMA density series. Um, and before we discuss that, um, density itself is very important to the longevity and the durability of the pavement. So based on what the pavement or where the pavement's located and what traffic is going to see, we have different levels of uh, monitoring that we do for the density itself. Uh, for expressways, high volume roadways, uh, we use 50 series. That's our most stringent requirement. And then uh, we have a 60 series for high volume roadways that are greater than 2,000 tons atop. Um, 70 series for high volume roadways where you have less than 2,000 tons atop or if you have a low volume roadway. And then we have 80 series and that's uh, primarily for miscellaneous placements, um, shoulders, bridge approaches, uh, T&L, shim, 6-3 mix, uh, and things like that. So next we want to discuss some of the methods to check density. So as I stated before, 50 series is the most stringent density requirement, and then 80 series is the least stringent as far as density monitoring goes. Uh, for 50 series, we take cords every day, uh, and we test those to determine the in-place density of the pavement. For 60 series, we construct a test strip, uh, core that, establish a PTD, and then there's additional coring to verify that PTD is being met. And that occurs every third day of mainline placement. Uh, for 70 series, there's no coring requirement. However, you do construct a test strip and you monitor density on a daily basis with a nuke gauge. And then for 80 series, there's neither coring nor nuclear gauge uh, monitoring. However, there is a table, table 402-6 in the spec book, uh, where it specifies the number of compass, the number of passes for compaction, and the contractor has to adhere to that. 
So let's talk about 50 series a little more in depth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as I said before, uh, 50 series is for your, your highest volume, most important roads, highest traffic volumes out there. Um, we have two options to construct a test strip. Option one, uh, which is basically construct the test strip and stop, or option two, which is uh, proceed with routine paving. And that's the contractor's choice. Um, if they feel confident in their paving operations and they want to keep going for the sake of the schedule, they're allowed to do so. However, there's implications if they aren't able to make the density uh, requirements in the contract. Um, if they go with option one, they stop, the materials engineer will test the cores, and then we'll tell them whether or not they were able to get uh, adequate density. Um, once they're able to achieve a passing test strip, then we routine density monitoring is done via uh, daily coring, and that applies to mainline paving or ramps that are greater than 1,250 feet. And then we use those core results, uh, determine a pavement density quality adjustment factor, or a QAF, and that QAF can range from a 0.6 to 105. So they have the option actually to get a bonus on 50 series. On 60 series projects, um, we still construct a test strip, either using option one or option two. We establish a project target density that the contractor has to follow. And then um, the contractor uses their nuclear gauge I should back up one moment and say this. So the purpose of the coring that we do during the test strip itself under 60 series is that we have nuclear gauge readings that are obtained by the contractor and we correlate that gauge to that mix using cores at specified locations that we pick out in the field. And then the materials group tests those cores to determine the actual density of the core. We compare that to the gauge readings and then we establish project target density and a correction factor for that gauge. And as I said, the contractor has to follow that. Um, every 200 feet, it's the density uh, new gauge operator will um, take a reading. It has to be between 96% and 103% of the PTD. And the moving average of the last 10 cannot drop below 98% of the PTD. Otherwise, we have to do a new test strip. If you want to read more on that, you can go to Materials Procedure 402-02, and that will explain more about the monitoring process. Um, there's forms that we'll go over later that uh, are filled out by the gauge operator that track the readings themselves. And um, we're required to actually witness the readings being taken, those readings recorded, and verify that the math's being done properly five times a day and we have to initial that. So um, if you're on a 60 series job or a 70 series, we'll go over in a minute, make sure that you're dropping back and seeing the nuclear gauge operator from time to time. <clears throat> um, so as we're paving under routine paving on 60 series, every third day of mainline placement, we're gonna take four additional cores over that day's placement. Um, and those cores are going to be tested. We're going to compare the results that we have to the test strip to see if we need to adjust the PTD at all. Um, if everything is fine and the contractor is getting good density, they get a QAF of a 1. If things are not going as well as they would have hoped, um, they can get a QAF down to a 0. 0.6. So that's a big distinction here between 50 and 60. 50 you can get a bonus, 60 you cannot get a bonus on. Um, also with 60 series, if you have multiple sites that you're doing, um, you don't need to do a new test strip at each site. However, what you would do is, is you would take verification cores at each new site on the first day to make sure that uh, the PTD is still valid at that site. And for those of you not, you have not seen blacktop cores, it's a little blurry picture, but uh, that's what they look like. <clears throat> 70 series, again, we construct a test strip. It's 1,500 foot max in one lane. Um, 
And how we establish the PTD is we take the highest densities at each of three random locations within the test strip, excluding the first 150 feet, and we average those. Okay, and that process we call peaking the gauge. Okay, and you can see by that figure, we've got some maximum density curves. The roller will continue to keep making passes over the, uh, the mat at these locations. And the new gauge operator keeps taking density readings. As you reach a point where uh, the gauge readings don't change by more than two pounds per cubic foot, uh, below 175 degrees, you consider that location peaked. And that graphs a representation of that where you'll see that they made one pass and we got a certain amount of density. They made another pass and then it increased a little more. And they continued to make passes until basically we couldn't compact the mat anymore. Um, if you continue to make passes, one of two things will happen. If the mix is tender, you actually can go backwards and you can lose density. That's the right portion of that, uh, that curve right there. You can notice that you can get it to a certain point, then you can overcompact the mat, and then you actually lose density. If the mix is already set up and it's locked up, you're not going to gain any more density out of it. <coughs> Once we establish the PTD, again, similar to 60 series, we're going to use a gauge. We're going to monitor every 200 feet. We have to make sure that each reading's of between 96 and 103 percent of the PTD, and the moving average stays above 98 percent of the PTD. Again, you can read materials procedure 40202 for and for more information on that, and we also have to go back and make sure that we're monitoring the gauge readings and make sure that the uh, forms are being filled out properly. 80 series compaction. So, as I said before, this method's basically used for 6.3 millimeter overlays. They're half, or I'm sorry, three quarters to an inch thick. So very thin placements. Uh, small placements such as bridge approaches, culverts, uh, if you have to do a culvert replacement, something like that. Um, TNL, where you don't have a thickness specified, uh, repairs, and again, <clears throat> density is based on the number of passes per table 402-6. And this is a copy of table 402-6 out of the spec book. You can show that it has two different options. You have an option for static compaction and an option for vibratory compaction. Again, it's the contractor's option which one they want to use. Sometimes site conditions dictate that they, maybe vibratory compaction isn't going to be possible, and they may have to look at static compaction, or there might be a note in the plans that might push them that direction. Um, but the contractor has to try to achieve the number of passes that they have here. Okay, So we'll just pick an example. For nine and a half top, under vibratory compaction, they have to make four vibratory passes and two static passes. And a vibratory pass is the movement of a roller with both drums vibrating. Okay, um, That's not very clear in the spec book, but that's what it means itself. And a static pass is obviously movement of the roller without the drums vibrating. Um, <clears throat> you can go with 100% um, static compaction it uses steel wheel and pneumatic rollers. Uh, we'll talk about different types of rollers in a minute. Um, I don't see that too often in the field, to be quite honest with you, with the pneumatic rollers. Most like to use the vibratory compaction because it's a little bit faster, it's a little bit quicker for them. But in some cases, that doesn't always, uh, it isn't always possible. Like I said, we're going to check the number of passes. Um, the engineer can modify the requirements of the table if necessary. So, for instance, if you're making all these passes and maybe the foundation of the pavement is poor and you're cracking it or on the shoulder, you're, you're doing damage, they're going to back off. And you should back off, okay, because that mat is not a, or that piece of roadway is not able to take that compactive force. And you don't want to do more damage because that's not going to give us any increase in density or durability of the pavement. Um, the other thing is, and, a, and a, one of your responsibilities would be ahead of paving is you're going to have to determine the number of impacts per foot in the spec. Okay, what that is equal to is you take the 
frequency of the roller setting that you have and we'll get into the roller data plates and whatnot and where those settings are but you take your frequency and you divide that by your roller speed obviously the faster you go the less impacts per foot you're going to get now rollers today they have some of them are high uh, frequency rollers they vibrate like crazy a lot better than they were 20 years ago so contractors can roll a little bit faster but you want to make sure that you're getting a minimum of 12 impacts per foot and um, again if you're doing damage to the pavement you're going to modify those settings okay and um, we should be following what the manufacturer's recommendations are on those data plates those stickers on the rollers themselves um, and if it can't be then the contractor has to demonstrate to us why they why they can't do that All right, so now we just went through some of the, the specs. Let's talk about getting ready to pave. So you're gonna be assigned to inspect a paving operation. And one of the responsibilities you're gonna have is to attend the pre-paved meeting. What the pre-paved meeting is, is it's a meeting that happens between the department and the contractor to discuss the plan. What are their operations? What order are they gonna pave this in? What's their schedule? Um, what type of equipment are they gonna use? What suppliers are they gonna use? How are they gonna do work zone traffic control? It discusses every aspect so that when we get out there with the, the equipment and we got the road closed, everybody's on the same page, okay? And what you should be doing is, is you wanna review your plans and, and your specs and you wanna think about questions that you're gonna wanna ask during this meeting that you might have so that all these discussions happen ahead of time. I've been to many pre-paved meetings in my career, some of which have gone very quickly where everybody goes, yeah, I, I, I know. And sometimes that works. Sometimes you get out in the field and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't know you were gonna do this. And that's not the time to find these, these things out, okay? And after you end up putting the blacktop down and then you have to have an argument, that's not the right time to, to have that discussion, so. Um, it's very costly for the contractor and it could be costly for the department. Um, another responsibility that you have, you need to review your specs. Okay, You have to go over all your specifications and then you also have to identify what types of mixes you're going to need out there. And we'll go into this in a little more detail. So as I said, you got to review your plans and your specs. Basically what that comes down to is you got to you got to read. We have a lot of reference documents out there. It's a lot of information, a lot of good information. We got the construction inspection manual. We got section 402, 407. You got the standard specs, section 402, 404 if you're doing warm mix, 407 for tack coat, 418 for long, or, uh, joint adhesive, and you also have materials procedure 402-02. And I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few too keep a copy of those documents with you. You have cell phones today, everything's electronic, so that shouldn't be an issue. Back when I started in the department, I had stuff stuffed under my arms and my back pocket all over the place, trying to keep track of all this stuff. But you wanna make sure that you know everything inside and out. The contractor knows these specifications probably as good as, if not better than you. And you wanna make sure that if there's an issue, that you're as knowledgeable as you can be, or if you see it, see something out there that doesn't look right, you can go and you can say to your EIC, hey, this is what happened, this is where I think they're wrong, and then we can have a discussion about that so we don't have a, a problem out in the field. Now one reference document that just came out not too long ago was uh, in the SIM. It's a paving checklist. Um, it's by no means inclusive because I don't think there is an inclusive checklist out there for every situation, but I'd encourage you to take a look at it and uh, to use that as a good reference, add to it as you uh, encounter different things in your career. So we're very well versed now in the plans and the specifications. The next thing we need to do <coughs> is identify what mixes are we supposed to be getting out there. So we have in our proposal a super paved special note and it looks very similar to this. And what it does is identifies two important things for us. It identifies the binder grade as well as the gyration level of the mix. And you might think, well, what the heck's the matter with, or what's up with those? 
The binder grade itself will tell you what kind of asphalt you should be getting in it, polymer, standard grade asphalt. Um, and the gyration level is going to be appropriate for that project uh, based on the traffic volumes and composition out there. And it used to be we had easels in these notes, okay? And this was something that just changed recently within the last year or two. Um, the Materials Bureau went to gyrations because in the blacktop plant, they deal with gyrations on the gyratory compactor. So um, you have a little table here now that sits in Materials Procedure 401, which not many of you reference, but now that I pointed out where it is, maybe you, you'll take a look at it. And it defines, or it correlates the easels to the number of gyrations out there. So for the example we had, we had 64 V22 asphalt and 75 gyrations mix. So 75 gyration mix is a less than 30 million easel mix, okay? <clears throat> and we take that information, and now we follow this through. And this table used to be in section 401 of the spec, but they took that out recently in a, an update. So now it sits in materials procedure 401, and you can begin to start deciphering what you need for your various mixes on the job and what's gonna be printed on the tickets. What's printed on the tickets is what we call a spark plug number. Okay, that's this 12F22HC. It's basically that whole number without the, the periods. And what you do is, is you take a combination of the item in the contract with the superpave special note, and those two things can tell you everything that you're gonna to need to know about what the mix needs to have. So for example, if I use the super pay special note we just had, and I have item 402.12.6.203 in my contract. What that is, is that is, I take the first two digits past the 402, so 402.12, so that's 12, that gives me 12 and a half, okay? We get that from the description off, off there, but that, that's how I remember it anyway, is those first two digits. So then the next thing is, is from our item number, we have to find out what friction it is. So we got 40212, which is the aggregate size, six, which is 60 series. Then we have two, which is the friction. And then 03 is the spec revision. So I look at two for friction. Well, this is a friction designation here, F2. So I know, okay, so I need a 12 F2 my super paved special note was for 75 gyrations. I went to my table. It says less than 30, because we can't make this easy, I guess. And uh, so we go to less than 30, which codes out as a two here in this table. So now I got 12 F22. I have a 402 item, so that's hot mix, okay? Um, if you had a 404 item, that would be warm mix. So that hot mix asphalt is an H. Again, if it's 404, be a W. We got H, so we got 12F22H. And then my asphalt from the note was a 64V22. And that's code C. So I got 12F22HC. That's why I should see on my ticket. So I go to my ticket. And granted, this is some older mix coding, so I will make the argument that uh, this is probably not a what you want to see on your ticket at all. But we're hopeful that this number here would say 12F22HC. Okay? So if this ticket showed up on the job, and I was out there as an inspector, and it's the first load that comes in, and I look at it, I would start questioning it and go, wait a minute, I don't know if this is the right stuff because it doesn't max, match the mix coding. And I would tell you that it probably isn't because this B here is standard grade asphalt. And your contract specified polymer, so you're not getting what you asked for. So that's the conversation that has to be had before that load goes down. 
So hopefully that gives you an idea on how to do a little bit of mix coding. So you're going to want to do this for every single mix that's in your contract. Okay. Top, binder, base, uh, applies to perm base, apply to your TNL, all that. <coughs> so now we're, we finally made it to the big day. We're getting ready to do some paving. So the equipment's on site, contractor's ready, everybody's ready. We got everybody out there. And uh, I guess before I, I go any further, I'll explain some of the, the equipment on here because this is a pretty good picture. So we've obviously got our, our haul trucks from the plant. Um, this is actually a materials transfer vehicle. We'll, we'll discuss that in a minute dumping mix into a paver, and then we've got the guys behind it, and then we've got our uh, steel drum vibratory roller here. But. So hopefully, like I said, you're all studied up, you know your specs, you know what mix you're supposed to be getting. Another important thing that might you might find helpful out in the field, and I will admit I did not write this, but it's a pretty good reference, and I think you all got this in your handouts, is uh, asphalt paving checklist. It's got a lot of equipment checks, inspector supplies, uh, some pre-paving info, tack coat, tickets, stuff to look for during placement, some DWR preparation things, things that you should be writing down, some how to do a yield check, your tack application rate, your QAF. Um, again, checklists are not all inclusive, but if it was me, and I had access to a laminator, I'd laminate this and put this with my clipboard. Um, and then I'd make some notes to it over time because it's got a lot of good information on here on, on what you need to follow. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get out there, we get busy and whatnot, and it's good to have a little reference to check to every once in a while. So we've got our checklist, other things that we need. <clears throat> so. Like I said, you're gonna need a clipboard so you can keep your asphalt tickets and all your certifications and whatnot um, and have something hard to write against. You're gonna need a heat gun. You're gonna need a measuring tape so that you can use that to get your widths and your yield. You're gonna need a calculator to help you with your yield calculations. You're gonna want some cold water, maybe a snack or so uh, because it can get pretty warm out there with the paver. You're gonna want a wooden ruler, maybe for doing some depth checks, sunscreen. Uh, you want a straight edge. Usually the contractor will provide you one um, so that you can check the, the cross slope on the mat, make sure everything's nice and true. Uh, it's hard to see down here, but uh, usually the contractor will have one of these. That's a poker, basically a threaded rod with two nuts on it and a washer so you can check your depth and something to write with. So the other thing you're going to want to do <coughs> before you get going is the gauge yeah, ugh, excuse me the gauge operator will show up on site and they have to be certified for 50, 60, and 70 series jobs. So if you're on one of those jobs, look for the gauge operator. Get a copy of their certification. You're going to have to make a copy so you can put it in the project files because um, and you want to make sure it's not expired. If you ran across Chris Euler, you'll notice that his is actually expired. It expired in 2011, so we wouldn't let him on the job. The other thing you want to do is you want to check your equipment. Okay, so we got our tack truck on site. We'll go through some of the stuff with that. We got our paver. We want to make sure that that's in good condition. Nothing leaking. It's running reliably. Looks like it's actually fit for the job. It's not like some little parking lot paver and we're trying to pave the interstate with it. Uh, we got our gauge operator. We got our rollers out there. We're gonna check for the data plates on those rollers. We're gonna ask the roller operator, what, are you, what settings you got them on? Okay, because again, these, these data plates on these rollers, um, depending on the layer thickness uh, that you're compacting and how thick you're, you're well, the type of material and the layer thickness itself, um, they have different settings of frequency and amplitude to get the same compactive effort, similar to dirt rollers. Um, and you wanna make sure that they're operating in that, that optimum range that the manufacturer rep, uh, recommends. 
primarily because we don't want to fracture stone. You can't go and set a roller up for top with a base setting and then go out there and expect to compact top. It'll start pounding the, the stone, it'll fracture it, and you'll have a loss of durability. Same thing goes for if I'm trying to compact base and I have a setting for top, I'm not going to get enough adequate density out there. We're going to have a problem all day long. So we want to make sure that we're in those ranges. And we also want to make sure that we're doing our impacts per foot calculation at that point. We got our trucks. They're starting to show up. Got to make sure that they're not using fuel oil. They got tarps. Um, they're not leaking all over the mat. And they want to make sure that they broom the pavement off so it's nice and clean. And they have something on site in case there's an accidental spill. Uh, you'd be surprised in my neck of the woods, you get all kinds of things between Amish and uh, tractors and everything else that uh, tend to follow up the roadway while you're trying to pave. <laughs> tack coat. Um, the tack truck, when it shows up on site, it has to be calibrated. And they have to provide a certification prior to using that tack coat for the truck and for the material. If the certifications aren't there, you're not supposed to be using those vehicles, okay? And um, the truck has to also be calibrated for the type of tack coat that you're using because tack coats can vary in viscosities depending on which ones you use. So you wanna make sure that it's been calibrated within the last year and um, it calibrate on the material you're using. Um, the reason why we use tack coat is because it provides a bond uh, between the asphalt layers uh, we do not tack on permeable base because it plugs the voids. Uh, and prior to the tack application, the surface has to be clean. Uh, tack coat works great, uh, but if you have a big pile of dirt and you spray oil over top of it, it's still going to be a big pile of dirt and it's still going to be a bond breaker. So we want to have a good, nice, clean surface to get a good bond there. And we want to make sure it's evenly applied and the tack has to break. So when it comes out of the back of the truck, it goes it, as an emulsion, a water and um, asphalt mixture. It looks brown, kind of like, it's not really mud, but it, it looks like muddy water coming out of the back of the truck. And it will turn black. That means it broke, okay? And then it's okay to pave on it. You can't pave on it until it breaks. That's a problem late in the season. So when your contractor's out there, and it's 40 degrees or hopefully 45 or higher and they were trying to pave and they go and tack the road and it takes a half an hour or 40 minutes for the tack coat to break because well it's cold then they have to account for that um, if it doesn't break or if you get excessive tack that could be detrimental to the pavement it could slide around and it could cause all kinds of other problems for you so and then the application rates, you're going to check those. They're down here. Um, depending on the number or the item number in your contract, a 407102 is a diluted tack coat. And a 407103 is a straight tack coat. Straight tack coats are usually used for thin lifts. They can be used in other locations for various reasons, but generally you use that on 6.3. Diluted is used generally for pretty much everything else. Um, and depending on what surface you're putting it on, you have a different application rate. Uh, for hot mix asphalt, it's a new, it's a lot different than you would on an existing surface itself. Okay, new hot mix asphalt for people who have walked across it can be sticky still. Um, so you don't need as much to get that good bond. Well, this is an example of a very uh, good preparation on a pavement. Nice milled surface, there's no loose stone, um, very uniform in texture, no dirt, um, no delamination, nothing. So this would be a great surface to pave on. So we've got a good surface, we're ready to go and tack. And then the tack truck takes off down the road. This is an example of poor tack coverage. Um, if you look closely, the tack is kind of just drizzling out of these nozzles. That's not what you want, okay? Um, you want what they call a triple lap coverage. You want a nice fan pattern coming out of each nozzle. It overlaps. And that's achieved based on the height of this bar, the pressure. It could be based on the viscosity of the tack coat itself, the angle of the nozzles, 
the wind sometimes can affect some op the, the application of the tack coat, so you got to watch that too. But primarily, you want to make sure that you do not see this. If you see this, um, you're not getting good coverage and you're not going to get a good bond. The other thing is, is if you see that and you go, well, why don't you just turn it up a little bit? Give me a little more tack. And you should be doing some yields on this as well as you're going down the road because you know what your theoretical is, what they're actually using. And I'll explain in a minute how you, how you check that. But you could turn this up all you want and all you're doing is just adding more tack in that location. It's not going to spread it out any wider. And <clears throat> believe it or not, if you have adequate triple lap coverage and you have everything set up right on the tack truck, you can use less tack with a properly set up tack truck than you can with this poor setup right here, turning it up. Um, I, I guess you're gonna have to take my word for it, but I've seen it out, out there in the field. Um, so if you see something like that, brings the contractor's attention, bring it to your EIC's attention, and they're gonna have to do some work there. So I talked about yield, okay? What you're gonna do is, um, when that, and we'll get into some payment things in a minute, but uh, back when I started, uh, I, I had one inspector I worked for, and he used to actually take a calibrated stick, and he used to actually climb on top of the tack truck and stick the tack truck at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day to determine the number of gallons they used. <clears throat> Technology being what it is today, we have pumps and we have meters um, that we use. Um, so you can stick the truck, but I would encourage you to use the meter. You need to take a reading before you start and a reading after. Just don't take the uh, tack truck operator's word for it, okay, because um, they may print you off a slip at the end of the day, but it's your responsibility to verify the quantities that actually went down. And if he, for whatever reason, um, started off with plus 200 gallons in there, at the beginning of the day, well, you're paying for extra material that never went down. and We can't be doing that. Um, what you're gonna wanna do is periodically throughout the day, <laughs> let's say he sprays his first pass out, he sprays a thousand foot. You know it's a thousand feet. So you know your width, you know your length, and you know what theoretically you should, be, you should have used in gallons. So you go to the tack truck driver and you say, hey, how many gallons did you spray so far? And the driver says, I sprayed 50. And you th say, well, it should have been about 55. So you look at that and you say, okay, is that acceptable based on what I have? Okay, is it within my range? Am I getting good coverage? Is everything working the way it's supposed to? And you keep tabs on them throughout the day. Now this slide is a good example of that good triple app coverage. This is what you want to see all the time out there in the field. Um, I won't promise you that you'll see it all the time like that, but that's what you want to be shooting for. Okay. I don't know. This one says there's a video, but I couldn't get the video to work. But I think the thing to, that's important here, you see a fan pattern right here, but you also see a plug nozzle. And then I think in here there's some nozzles that are not working quite right and, and whatnot. Um, you want to make sure you don't have any plug nozzles. Again, you want to get that triple lap coverage. And you want to make sure that uh, you're getting consistent uniform application across the map. And here's an example of a good versus a bad uh, application rate. You got a lot of streaks in here, whereas you have a nice black uh, gooey looking surface for the, the black top to stick to. The other thing that you want to get from the tack driver uh, when they show up on site is you're going to need it not only for your tack sample, but you're also going to need it for your project documentation is the tack truck cert. Our spec says you can't apply the tack without the cert because you don't know what's in that truck. You don't know if it's compatible with the mix that you're putting down. Um, you don't even know if it's tack coat. There's emulsions out there that are not tack coat. They don't tack test this tack coat and you're going to say well how would I know that you're going to look down here and you see a T for tack coat okay 
Plus, you're going to have this discussion, hopefully, during the prepaved meeting, so you'll know what they're going to be using. The other thing you're going to look for, certification date. So if they brought that on site today, um, our spec says if it's over 30 days past that certification date, we can't apply it. They have to retest the material. So this date is from September 19th of last year. If they brought that on our job, I'd have to say, no, I can't accept that. They also need to make sure that distributing contractor signing it down here, as well as the primary source where it came from, okay? Which in this case, it was Midland Lions up here. It's not working. Um, so, and I did not discuss uh, tax samples. You should be getting a sample, one per project minimum. EIC can increase that if they feel necessary, or if you see a problem with the tax code operation, if it looks watery, it's not breaking, there's a problem out there, grab another sample. The materials group's got tons of tack bottles, and, uh, um, and you basically give that to the driver. They're supposed to fill it out of a sampling valve. If the sampling valve's left high and dry for some reason, we don't encourage you to take it out of the spray bar, but if you're going to take it out of the spray bar, make sure that the material coming out of the spray bar is representative of what's going in the road because sometimes they flush those spray bars with diesel. You hand them the tack bottle first thing in the morning. They go, oh, I'll grab that right for you. I haven't even started today. And they put nice diesel infused tack coat in there and then it fails. And then we have to deal with the failure. Whether is, was it a failure or was it not a failure? Then we have that discussion. So just make sure that our sampling is representative. And as I mentioned before about tack quantity, um, we want to go and take a measurement or reading first thing in the morning and then at the end of the day. You also need to record the temperature on the truck because there's temperature correction factor. We pay our quantities at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I can assure you the TAC truck does not have TAC at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be a little hotter than that. Um, you could use this table. When I started in the field, that's what we used. Um, there's also on the back of your checklist a formula that came right from the 407 spec. So you can take what the temperature reading you are getting off of the truck is and the number of gallons, and you can determine your pay quantity right off of that. So we got our tack coat down, and now uh, we're gonna start paving. So this is quite an old picture. Um, we don't have, I've not seen skis that large in many, many years, uh, but that, that's an example of a contact ski for those who haven't seen that. So we discussed before about material transfer vehicles. Okay. Um, usually you do not see them on a job. I won't say that you'll never see them on a job. Usually it's by spec or no. Um, contractors don't uh, usually bring extra equipment on site if they're not told they have to or they're not being paid for it. Um, the advantage of using a material transfer vehicle is that it allows your paving operation to continue, um, whether you have a break in trucks, um, so it minimizes your wait time there. Um, it could, uh, if you have temperature differentials between trucks or you have chunks in a truck, it can help break some of those up and it can help reduce segregation. And how it does that is this. So typically, truck will dump into the paver hopper rate or hopper right here. Instead of doing that, there's a hopper on the front of the material transfer vehicle. You can't see it in the picture, but the truck will dump in there, and then there's a remix inside the actual material transfer vehicle. It churns everything up, and then it spits it out into the hopper here, and then that way it allows the paver to keep going at a constant speed. Because as we'll discuss, the consistency, or to get consistent paving, you have to be consistent. So material transfer vehicles help with that. Um, so if you see one, that's what they're used for. And so then, as I said, the material goes in the paver hopper. Okay, we've got some different components here of the hopper. We got the slat conveyors. They work independently, depending on what the demand is at the screed for the mix, how fast they, they run. We have some flow gates here. Those are adjusted based on the size of the mix, although I'll be honest with you, as of late in the field, I haven't seen too many people who adjust those because 
it's kind of tough to get them adjusted. The larger the opening size, for the larger the aggregate. The purpose of um, having those flow gates in there, though, is that you want a uniform head of material going to the screed. Because again, we want consistent flow material going through that paver to get us a consistent pavement that's going to give us a uniform ride, uniform density, and all the things that we want. So you always want, though, regardless, these flow gates to be buried with mix while you're paving. If they're not buried, especially with coarser mix, it'll start bringing coarser stuff into the paver. And that's going to be a problem. Some other components of the paver. We've got uh, the hopper itself. We discussed uh, the truck goes up against the push rollers. We got the tractor, which provides the power. We got the slat conveyors. They're down here. Um, we got. We'll discuss the screed itself and the components of that in a minute. But as the material comes through the hopper, the slat conveyors take it back here to the spreading augers in the tunnel itself. The augers push that out and then it encounters the screed itself. And then the screed, how that works is you have a tow point on the tractor itself and, it, and the screed is a free floating mechanism. I know they have hydraulic assist and some other things on there, but it's supposed to act as a free floating mechanism. You set your depth with your crank up here when you first start. So when you you back the paver up to the joint after they go and they mill their rebate in, you put your stickers down, you set the screed down on it, they set their depths with their cranks, and then they take off down the down the lane. You'll see the paver operator or the screed people, they'll be sticking the mat as they're going along with that threaded rod because they know what depth they want to get. Now, little tip. So when you lay mix, because you have to have a little bit of a fluff in it before you can compact it, you lay it a quarter inch per inch loose greater than what you want for your compactive depth. So if I'm going to pave an inch deep, I lay mix at an inch and a quarter. So they'll go down through if I'm going to lay an inch of mix and they keep sticking it at the edge, in the center, at the other edge, trying to make sure that it, um, we get that depth that we're looking for consistently and uniformly across there. They'll check their cross slope, they'll check everything on that. Once that's set with those cranks, you don't touch them, okay? And um, <coughs> so as we move forward with this, um, this, this angle of attack becomes important. So that can be affected by many different things. It could be affected by the amount of mix here in the tunnel. It could also be affected by the speed at which the paver is running. So as I go faster, it tends to float more. As I go slower, it tends to sink. It's just the way it works. Okay, if I got a lot of material out ahead of this sitting in the tunnel, let's say I'm stopped on the mat, and I take off, I get a bump. So the, the key is, is to make sure that we have consistency in how we pave so that this machine, which works very well, can do what it was designed to do. All right, <laughs> so, and in this picture, it talks about the force F3. Um, like I said, that varies as the tractor speed increases or decreases, and then that head of material. You want the paver speed to remain constant. If they stop continually, the things I just mentioned about the bumps and the dips and all these different things, that's going to affect your ride. So if you get consistent flow of material, consistent speed, that's going to help give you a consistent paving product out there. Um, and like I said, it's going to change mat thickness. Um, the flow of material inside the, 
the popper itself too, I'll mention that as well. If you let that run down too low, same issue will happen because you're gonna starve that tunnel for material. Um, if you let it get too low and you'll have a bump, then you'll have a dip. When you go down the road, you're gonna feel that. Uh, you'll feel every single load in that, that mat. Now, before I said with the, the screed depth cranks, we don't uh, have to change those at all during paving. If for some reason you have to, let's say the pavement changes or we're trying to do something with the paver <coughs> itself uh, to try to correct an issue. Remember, it takes five times the length of this tow arm for that adjustment to happen because of the way that paver actually operates. So back in the day, they used to call them windmill willies. The guy would sit there and he'd crank it this way and then he'd crank it back the other direction trying to get his depth in. It takes, in a 10 foot tow arm, it takes 50 feet for that adjustment to be made. So it doesn't pay to make many, many adjustments. All you're gonna do is just make the mat go inconsistent as far as depth and your ride's gonna be affected. So, like I said, once you get it where you want it, you get it set, they should not be touching that. All right. The other important thing is auger and tunnel extensions. Okay. Um, so, when screed extensions are necessary, which is basically if you're paving over 15 feet wide, you want to add auger and tunnel extensions. If you have coarse mix out here, it has a tendency to roll to the outside edge. You can get some segregation in your mat. Um, you need to have a tunnel extension that comes out here to confine it, and then an auger that helps consistently push that material out. And then another thing that's important is mix temperature, because we want consistent density. Hot black top, it's easier to get density. You get cold spots in the mat or you get cold chunks and whatnot. It, it makes the density inconsistent, <coughs> excuse me, and it also affects your ride. Um, so you wanna be making sure that you're checking your temperature at the hopper or inside the truck. If you're using an uh, infrared gun, carefully make sure that you're getting the gun closer to the mix so you're not reading the air between the mix and the gun. Um, you could also use a dial thermometer or stick thermometer if you're going to reject a truck, I suggest that's what you use uh, because those infrared thermometers, again, there can be some variation in there. And you want to make sure the temperature is between 325 and 250, plus or minus 20 degrees, okay? And if you need a dial thermometer, contact your materials group. We have lots of asphalt thermometers. We can give, give them out to you, okay? And the other thing that's important is we want to make sure the temperature doesn't exceed 325, especially with polymer because once that happens, the polymer starts to burn and um, the gases that are given off can be pretty, uh, pretty nasty uh, and it can make you and the paving crew sick. Um, one of the indications of that's gonna be blue smoke. You see blue smoke out there, that's gonna be a problem. So um, you wanna try to stay away from that. And obviously when you have burnt mix too, it's burning all the asphalt off. So from a durability standpoint, that's, that's not good for our product either. Like I said, um, consistency is, is the key to a good mat. Um, it doesn't mean that the paver never stops. Sometimes you run out of trucks. At the end of the day or two o'clock in the afternoon, trucks disappear and then all of a sudden you get flooded with trucks at the end of the day. Um, you wanna try to creep the paver. You wanna try to keep the paving operation moving within reason. If you gotta stop, you gotta stop. You just wanna minimize the number of stops that you have to end up making. Like I said, make sure that uh, if you're going to be creeping the paver, you want to make sure that those slat conveyors are not visible. Uh, because if they're, they're visible, then you're going to have a possibility of segregation or you're going to be starving the screed for uh, mix and you could end up with a dip in there. Um, some rollers, we've got dual drum vibratory rollers. This is an example of a Dynapack. Um, again, we've got two steel wheels. Um, the two steel wheels themselves as opposed to a pneumatic tire roller 
which has all these tires. Um, if you've ever seen a pneumatic tire roller, they're they're quite fascinating to watch. Um, you know, they heat the tires up and whatnot so that the mix doesn't stick to them, and it takes a little bit actually so the mix won't stick. Um, you you use these primarily when you have a mix that you can't compact with a steel roller. If you have a really tender mix, um, because these compact from the bottom up, or if you have a really thick layer that you're you're trying to deal with, um, they work well for that. Um, and then you use a steel roller to um, make a finish pass over top of it to kind of take out some of those roller marks and, and tire marks and whatnot in it. Um, on 80 series compaction jobs, because again, we're going based on the table and we're going on the roller settings, we wanna make sure the roller settings are accurate. So I don't know how many people have seen a vibrating reed tachometer, but that's what one looks like. Uh, your contractor is supposed to provide one to you. You set it on the pavement next to the roller, hopefully not in the path of the roller because they like to run them over. And uh, you watch the little hammers vibrate, and then that will tell you what the frequency is of that the roller is vibrating at. So go through some common problems that you might encounter out in the field. Um, chunks. That picture on the left shows blacktop chunks. Um, that's cold mix. And in addition to paving crews not liking to shovel them, it doesn't do our mat any good too because they're future potholes. So when you start seeing chunks like that, if you see them get incorporated in the mat, politely ask them to please remove them. Um, the other situation you see on the right, and it's a little difficult to see, is there's mix in front of that tire on that uh, steer tire on the paver. Well, when the paver rides up over top of that, it's going to upset everything that you just went and spent all that time to try to dial in, and you're going to get nice bumps. Um, trucks can clean out in front of the paver, but you try to keep that material limited into the center of the paver itself. You don't want it underneath those tires, uh, because if you get it underneath the tires, like I said, you'll get bumps, and you'll get a, a poor ride out of it. The picture in the upper left is an example of oversized aggregate. Um, they occasionally find their way into blacktop loads. This one appears to be uncoated, so it might have been sitting up on a tarp or up in the box somewhere. Guy didn't have a clean box. Um, but that's not going to do our mat any good. Um, if the roller runs over it, they're going to fracture it, and that will be a future pothole. So we want to keep an eye out for that. If we continue to see oversized, there might be a hole in the screen at the plant. And uh, we definitely got to make uh, the materials group aware of that. Um, lower left, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but we've got a hydraulic lead on the roller. Hydraulic fluid and blacktop don't mix well together. Um, it causes a problem with the asphalt and uh, you will get Traveling and potholes later. Um, another issue <coughs> up here, we've got plug nozzles on our uh, spray bar for our steel drum roller. Um, that'll cause the mix to stick to it and pick up on the roller, which creates all kinds of havoc out there. And uh, there really is no good fix for that. Um, so we got to keep an eye on that, make sure that they're using uh, the contractors got to make sure they're using nice clean water. They put a little dish soap in there to help it, um, the drums from sticking. And then down here in the lower right, uh, looks like they're kind of broadcasting material across there. There must be they had a hole or a chunk or something like that in the mat, and they're trying to fix that. So we got to talk about safety a little bit. Um, Obviously, with a paving operation, you're going to be working adjacent to traffic. Make sure that uh, everybody, including yourself, has high vis apparel on at all time. Um, the biggest issue you're going to run, run into possibly is complacency. Um, I've been out there over 20 years paving, and uh, to be honest with you, you get near traffic and you get too comfortable. And all it takes is one person or uh, one bad move, and uh, it's a bad day. So... Um, the main key for ourselves to stay safe is that we have to observe from a safe distance, okay? 
that doesn't mean that we have to be right on the center line. If you do have to be out there, make sure you're efficient with your time out there and don't linger. Okay, do what you have to do and then get back to a safe, safe spot. <coughs> um, for contractors and whatnot, if they have to work out there, um, just make sure that they're observing safe practices. They're not just running out into traffic uh, or uh, doing sometimes the crazy things that they tend to do. Um, some other issues, um, hot material, like I said, uh, blue smoke, that's uh, something that really needs to, to be addressed. Uh, we probably wanna be standing um, upwind of any smoke coming from a blacktop operation, if we can help it. Um, I know many of us have breathed in blacktop fumes over the years, but uh, probably not the, the greatest stuff for us. So if you can avoid it, um, it would be a good thing. The other thing too is, is sometimes you get quite a bit of smoke going on and you get enveloped in the smoke and uh, nobody can see you. So you don't wanna be the guy that gets backed over or girl that's been backed over. We had an unfortunate accident this year that where somebody uh, got killed, got backed over on a paving operation. Um, the other thing too is burns. Um, we have to, well, hot mix is hot. Um, blacktop burns hurt. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're being safe around uh, our blacktop and whatnot and make sure that we're, uh, we're not getting too close to it. Lean up against the trucks, hot stuff, that type of thing, be aware of that. Nighttime operations, make sure you got a lighting plan. Um, the equipment's lighted, you know, address any traffic concerns, um, you know, backing equipment, um, make sure that you're visible to the equipment and uh, no blind backing, okay? Make sure that everybody's got backup alarms, that type of thing, and also watch for uh, overhead electrical hazards. So some segregation of map problems and I'm not going to go th read this verbatim, but basically if you see defects like uh, roller marks or cracking, tearing, segregation, that type of thing, um, or any other irregularities, bleeding, um, you make sure that you're making that aware or the contractor aware of that. And then also the EIC as well and documenting that um, because that product that we're buying at the end of the day is supposed to be defect free. So, um, we covered this already as far as making sure that uh, we're getting consistent supply of mix and make sure that the slat conveyors aren't exposed. Um, some other issues that you might see, bleeding and flushing. Um, this is an example of what flushing looks like. You can see in the wheel paths uh, where the core holes are that the pavement's flushed. Um, that could be because of too much asphalt, could be because of too much fines. Uh, bottom line is, is it's not a stable, durable map, and it needs to be evaluated. So uh, the other thing to note here, those core holes, they haven't been filled in. Make sure that we're filling our core holes in. Okay, those are future potholes. Make sure they're doing everything they can to get good density with those core holes that they're filling in. And uh, one thing I did not mention that may cause this, um, you might see this if you're, let's say you have an intersection, you're opening edge of traffic early and it's still pretty hot. Car tires themselves will help draw some of that asphalt up out of the mix. So you may see this and it might be a short term uh, situation. Um, oh, as well. And the other thing too, fuel oil. If you see fuel oil and it'll be pretty easy and you'll be able to smell it. You can see that as a sheen coming out of the back of the truck itself and it'll also tend to cause the asphalt to bleed to the surface. <laughs> All right, uh, segregation, um, that can happen either through the truck loading process, um, if you don't have your auger extensions, or sometimes if you have excessive dumping of the wings on uh, coarser mixes, you can see in this picture, you've got the end of load segregation going up through there and whatnot, where you can see the end of every single load. So if you see that as an issue, bring it to the contractor's attention. Um, if you believe it might be truck loading related, bring it to the materials engineer's attention. Again, 
if you don't have your auger and tunnel extensions, that can create some segregation problems. Pavement tears. This is a tear. What happens is, is that uh, if you have a tender mix or you're compacting in the tender zone, you make your first roller pass, it makes the mix stick. And then as you're coming back through, the mix will push out ahead of the roller and it'll actually, the mat over here will stay while the other mat will continue moving and it'll cause a tear. Uh, that's a future crack because you have poor density in that area. If you see that, stop. Don't do anything else. Wait until the temperature drops a little bit, continue compacting. Obviously, it's you got to bring it to the contractor's attention if they want to continue to do damage. That's their business, but you might end up having to mill that, that piece out. Bumps. Um, well, there's lots of different causes of bumps. Um, sometimes you can get crack seal bumps. Um, you can get uh, problems with the mat moving itself and it'll fold over on itself. You could have poor paving practices. Um, you know, you could have excessive compactive effort. Um, just make sure again, they're doing everything as consistent as they possibly can and make sure that we're not uh, reversing directions quickly or stopping on the mat. Uh, abruptly, um, those types of things, and that'll help minimize some of the bumps. Another thing that, uh, that's one of the first things they teach you when you go out and follow a paver is do not walk on the top course. You will leave divots in the mat, your paving crew will be very upset with you, and your EIC will also be very upset with you. So um, it is acceptable on binder and base to walk on it. You don't walk all over it like you're you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's not like you're walking down the sidewalk. You try to minimize the amount of time that you're in it, but you definitely do not walk on top course, walk around. Joint failures. Um, this is an example of a joint failure itself at center line. Why do joints fail? Because we get lack of proper density. Okay. Uh, you either can have a bad, uh, Construction practice, pinching the joint with the roller. You cannot have enough material at the joint. Sometimes people like to make nice pretty joints. Well, pretty joints aren't necessarily durable joints. Sometimes you have to have a little bit of overlap. So uh, you wanna make sure you got enough material in there so that you can compact against that joint to get good adequate density. Um, you may have a lack of a bond between the hot and cold joints. Let's say you put out a leg today, you come back and you match tomorrow. There might be an issue there with the bond. Um, sometimes you'll get poor joints that uh, you're not sure what kind of uh, control that the paver operator is following. They're kind of all over the place. And um, all those situations lead to joint failure. And the problem with joint failure is you're gonna get moisture and dirt down in there and then it'll just continue to go from there. So we, diver we have a joint density spec that's uh, right now not statewide, but within the next year will be. That's to help improve joint performance, um, make the contractor pay attention to joints, uh, and inspire some innovation. Um, they get to use their best practices. Uh, we've seen some things like these pizza cutter things that are on the joint itself to kind of cut them clean, as well as joint heaters and, and joint makers. Um, so, if you haven't had one of those jobs, uh, probably within the next year or so, you're gonna start seeing more. And then how we check the joint density itself is we actually take a core over the joint and then uh, we use the density of those cores to determine pay factors in the contract. We also use joint adhesive. Um, that provides, a, it pre-seals the crack so to speak, um, provides a sealer between the joints. Uh, for the butt joint, you take that entire vertical face and you cover it and the wedge joint, you get the first, uh, you do the vertical face and then the first three, four inches on the wedge. Um, one thing you wanna <clears throat> look at is how they're applying it and the speed they're applying it, that's pretty important. If they go too fast, they're not gonna apply enough or sometimes they get, uh, a little careless and they'll go onto the mat or they'll go off on onto the existing pavement uh, in the case of a butt joint and you won't get any joint sealing on there 
and that's not doing us any good. And if you get it on the mat, it'll pick up and uh, it actually will pull the mat in the adjacent lane. It gets stuck to the roller and uh, it, it creates a, a heck of a mess. So it's one of those operations that the contractors uh, don't take as seriously as some of the other things, but um, it really needs to be paid attention to out there. So, and the last thing is documentation. Now, I know this is an old form. We do everything in site manager now, but it would, wouldn't hurt to have a Merc 4 out in the field because it's a good way to document your labor and equipment, do your yields, um, and document any other things that you need to do on there. Um, we, back when I started in the field, that's all we had. Um, and, you know, it's been refined over the years, and it's a pretty inclusive document, but I think it's a good uh, resource to have on your clipboard so that you can get ready to do your uh, DWR. Again, 60 and 70 series compaction, those are the forms that uh, the BR340 and 341 that are filled out daily, and uh, those are the ones that we have to be witnessing and initialing five times a day as well as we got to be grabbing tickets. Now, one thing with tickets that we want to do is you want to make sure that you have a system to number your tickets. Um, how I used to do it when I was in the field is uh, you'd start off in the lane and you put station zero plus or zero zero plus zero zero left travel lane. And I'd put a one up to the top. And then when I got to the end of that lane, then I would go and put end whatever. If it was a partial truck, I would say I'd estimate how much and that truck went into that lane so that I could use it later for my yield calculations. Um, you also want to be, make sure that you're taking temperature readings um, in the trucks, recording those on the tickets. You will we'll see temperature readings from the plant on the tickets as well. You want to circle information like the D number, the tonnage, the material, that type of thing on there, just showing that you checked it. Um, you can do separate yield calcs. Again, on that Merc 4 form works nice. Or you could do them right on the ticket if you want. And uh, the, the idea is, is that you want to be able to go afterwards. Uh, let's say a month later, somebody asked you where this load of blacktop go, you could easily pull those, that stack of tickets out and you can say, that's exactly where that went. It went in this lane. You may not know exactly where in the lane is, but I could figure that out from there. We talked before about the tax certification. Got to make sure we get a copy of that. And apologize, I went a little long. Um, does anybody have any questions 